Our gospel today comes to us from Matthew, the fourth chapter. I want you to know that this happens directly after Jesus is baptized by John. When Jesus comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, and God's voice from the heavens says, This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. And immediately after the baptism, this is what happens next. The Gospel according to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone." Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite books that I like to recommend to people is The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Has anyone read that book? No? Couple? Mom? Okay, Stephanie? Good? Okay, good. (laughs) Now we know where I get it. (laughs) In the Screwtape letters, Uncle Screwtape is writing to his nephew Wormwood and giving him advice about the family business. He wants his nephew to be successful, of course, in the family business. The point is to help the nephew get clients. Actually, he only has one client. And he wants that client to really invest, really be loyal to the family business. What is their business? Well, they are devils. Now, the foundational piece of advice that Screwtape gives is you need to get your client to believe that we don't exist, that the devil doesn't exist at all. The client is just a regular person like you or me. And in this book, C.S. Lewis makes this argument that the devil's greatest trick is getting us to believe he doesn't exist. That way, when something bad happens, we're bound to blame God or ourselves. And when we blame ourselves, we'll have feelings of shame and guilt, which they can use in their family business. It's an interesting prospect, right? And it's a great book. You should all try reading it. It's wonderful. But in our gospel lesson today, we know the devil is real. The devil shows up and the devil quotes scripture. And Jesus quotes it right back at him. Jesus quotes it and they go round and round here in our gospel lesson. Now, Jesus has been in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and we are to understand that he is in a weakened state. 40 is a common number in the Bible. It's always something significant. Noah was on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. The Israelites wandered through the desert for 40 years. They had it worse than 40 days. 40 years they were wandering in the desert. Moses was on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments for 40 days and 40 nights. 
And our friend, the prophet Elijah, was running for his life toward Mount Horeb, away from Jezebel and King Ahab, running for his life for 40 days and 40 nights. And now we are in the New Testament, and Jesus has fasted again 40 days and 40 nights when the devil appears. And the devil tempts him. He offers him temptations. The first temptation is one that would say, satisfy your physical need, right? Have food. Satisfy your physical need. But Jesus makes it clear that what gives life comes from God. What is life-giving is connected to God. Then the devil comes to him and tempts him with almost a superficial way of thinking about God, like how to get God to do a party trick, right? Fall down, he'll catch you. Jesus makes it clear that God's word and God's way is profound. There is no shortcut to wisdom. Finally, the devil comes to him and offers him power, simple power, which is laughable. And Jesus essentially does laugh in his face because all authority in heaven and on earth belong to him. Jesus resists these temptations easily. What would be tempting for us in a weakened state of fasting for an uncomfortably long time is easy for Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, while he is fully human, is also fully God. So what is a temptation for us, for Jesus, is merely a test. Not a pass-fail test like you have at school, but think of like a car manufacturer puts a vehicle through a test to make sure that at the critical moment, when an accident is coming, it will withstand the impact in a crisis. Jesus passes that kind of test. I, for one, find that comforting. I find it comforting the one who resists temptation teaches us to pray. Lead me not into temptation. We can pray that with confidence. Now, we are excused for spending a lot of time looking at this temptation section of the gospel lesson because it takes up the most room, right? It's the majority of the gospel. Plus, it's conflict. And as much as we want to say that we're not into drama, we're drawn to it. Trouble takes our attention. We always look to that kind of conflict between people, like, like a car accident that we can't take our eyes off of. We want to know what happened, and we kind of want to know how to prevent it from happening to us. We pay attention. Bad news is always on blast in our world. It always is. Whether it's the media or if we run into a friend who has just a litany of bad luck stories to tell us, we hear it all the time. It takes our time and attention. So we're excused for spending a lot of time, sometimes years and years, thinking about this interaction between the devil and Jesus. But there are two small pieces of this gospel that really matter. They are small but mighty. They're the bookends. Did you see in the beginning of this gospel, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness? The Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness but does not leave him there. He leads Jesus and does not leave him Yes, Jesus is brought into the wilderness, but he is not abandoned and alone. In the wilderness, the Holy Spirit is present. And then at the end of the gospel, we are told that angels come. Angels come to wait on him. My friends, this is great news for us. This is great news. 
in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit is present and more help is on the way. The Holy Spirit is present and more help is on the way. When you are in your wilderness, that is true for you too. How do I know? Because the Bible shows us Jesus giving the Spirit to us as our comforter, as our advocate. This is how we know this is true. And we have been in the wilderness. We know we have been in the wilderness. And I don't just mean a walk in the woods, although that's healthy. You should probably try that too. The wilderness is a spiritual, emotional place for us. A place where we are left with the questions that we need to wrestle with. A question of a diagnosis, maybe. Why for this to be true? The wilderness is the place where we might say, I need one more hour, one more day of sobriety. The wilderness is the place where we are to gather strength to leave a bad relationship. The wilderness is a place where we maybe find ourselves without even knowing how we got there. When something clues us in that we are not ourselves anymore. This has happened to me. I have been in the wilderness without realizing that I went there. After I had both of my children, I suffered from postpartum depression. And I was not helped or treated after my first child. It wasn't until after my second. And by that time, people came to me and said, Amy, something is not quite right here. Those were angels to me. Angels who came to help me. And through that help, I could see that the entire time the Spirit had been present. The entire time. Now that I'm older, <laughs> I have actually entered the wilderness on purpose sometimes. I go there to be with God and gain strength. I go to be present and to wrestle with the questions that make me ache and keep me up at night. Sometimes the things that I fear the answers to. I know you know what I mean. The wilderness is that place. For Lent this season, we are journeying through the wilderness together. And we can take comfort, confidently knowing that the wilderness is a place where the Holy Spirit is present and more help is on the way. We need not fear it. We are not alone. We're together in this place. We will be angels to one another, and we will know that the Spirit is with us. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you our deepest praise and all of our thanks for guiding us, comforting us in our wilderness times. Thank you for those who come to us to wait on us our angels. Lord God, help us to help others. We pray all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.